Well, welcome back everyone to From Quarries to Rock Cut Site, Echoes of Stone Crafting, our two-day conference. Um, this is our first day and we move on to our final panel of the day. Um, I am Katie Whitaker, your conference chair, um, uh, and I'll be taking you through this afternoon. We're going to hear from three speakers again in this next panel, and I'm joined by one of the conference organizers, Claudia Schuto. Um, so I'd like to remind our three speakers they have 15 minutes for their presentations. And as I've been trying to do in the morning, I will ring my bell at 13 minutes. So when you have a, a two minute warning, and then I will also ring the bell at 15 minutes, please conclude and draw your presentation to a close at that time. After each presentation, we will have a few minutes perhaps for one question, but of course we're focusing our questions and discussion uh, on the um, discussion time after we've heard from our three speakers. So without further ado, we're going to begin this afternoon with a presentation from Angel Javier Carnenes Matambutrago from the University of Castilla-La Mancha, who will speak about the millstone quarry of Pedrola, Alcada de San Juan in Spain. Angel, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Welcome. Thank you for being here and please take the floor. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my screen. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization of the Congress for their attention and good disposition. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to participate in this International Congress on behalf of the research team of Piedro Archaeological Site to present the results of the investigations that have been carried out in this place since uh, 2013, with special attention to the millstone quarries uh, found at it. Uh, well, first of all, where is Piedro uh, Piedro Piedrola uh, archaeological site uh, is located about six kilometers northwest to the city of Alcázar de San Juan in the province of Ciudad Real, uh, which is uh, one of the five that make up uh, the Castilla-La Mancha region that, as you can see, uh, are located in the center of the Iberian Peninsula in the south of Madrid and north of Andalusia. In Alcázar de San Juan, there has always been uh, knowledge uh, of the existence of a large archaeological site in Piedrola, but uh, there was no specific knowledge about its importance or chronological uh, period. In 2013, the Alcázar de San Juan City Council uh, commissioned the University of Castilla-La Mancha to carry out the archaeological study of the area. Intensive survey of the site was carried out, which made it possible to determine the presence of surface materials uh, from at least five chronological uh, periods. The oldest, in grey, uh, dates from recent prehistory between the Calcolithic and Bronze Age. The next one, in orange, uh, dates from Iron Age, uh, with materials associated with uh, Iberian culture. Uh, the areas uh, highlighting red uh, materials from the Roman period were found. Uh, the green area stands uh, out for its presence of medieval uh, materials. And finally, uh, the areas uh, highlighted in grey indicate the location of the quarries of Millstone dating from early modern period. As we can see, it's a very large site, uh, about two square kilometers in size, with a continuous occupation of, of about uh, 40 centuries. In 2014, excavation campaigns uh, were began with the aim of increase uh, our knowledge of the site. And before moving on the specific case of this presentation, the quarries, I would like to show you in detail some images of the results of this excavation. Uh, from prehistory times, where we found some holes with the presence of bell shaped ceramics and human remains that have provided dates of C14 located uh, between uh, 1975 and 1819 uh, before Christ. From the ancient age, uh, the remains of a large uh, Roman villa were located with the presence of terra sigillata pottery, uh, which rich decoration, such as this uh, case, which bear decoration. In addition, a mosaic fragment uh, of very fine desera uh, was found. Uh, from the Middle Age, in addition to a multitude of ceramics dating from around the year 1000, a necropolis of Islamic rite uh, called Makbara has been located. Uh, in the image, we can see two of the bodies deposit in the right lateral cubitus uh, without great goods and look, looking towards Mecca. 
And finally, we reach the quarries. Uh, during the survey, uh, 15 millstone extraction points were located, uh, dated by typological criteria in early modern period. And uh, let's go to see them in detail. These are all the documented millstone quarries in Castilla-La Mancha. Uh, as you can see, most of them are in the province of Guadalajara uh, in the north, followed uh, by another concentration in the west of the province uh, of Ciudad Real. And as you can see, uh, Piedra is alone in the middle of the region. The productive uh, power of the quarry seems enormous, judging by the 15 hectares of extension and the quantity of discarded pieces that we are, were located. Parallel to the archaeological study of the site, uh, we began to develop an investigation into documentary sources that could shed light on the knowledge of the operation of the quarry. We were able to find a reference in the quarry to the quarry uh, in a mill located 96 kilometers away, uh, the Balbuena water mill in Corral de Calatrava, which allowed us uh, to establish a hypothetical sales radius uh, of about 96 kilometers, uh, a very large area of influence that reached almost to the capital of the country, you can see here. Uh, and we have been able to find three other mills that order stone printing wheels in Piedrola. In this are the Grignon water mill in the mill, 48 kilometers away. Uh, the Grande water mill uh, in Manzanares, 51 kilometers away. And the Medina water mill in Silices, 62 kilometers away, which is uh, also the oldest reference uh, to the Piedra and Millstone production that we have discovered in the sources in the year 1507. Uh, these uh, great distances raise uh, the question of how pieces of stone over a ton were transported from the quarry to mill so far away. Yes, we're in, square in, in, in this map. As you can see, the quarries are highlighted in gray and the roads, the, the roads in red, yellow, and white. As you can see, uh, Alcázar San Juan uh, and Piedrola are joined uh, by the road to Madrid, marked in red. Uh, this will be a main road uh, in the early modern period, and it went directly to the Cañada Real Soriana, uh, it's the equivalent of a highway uh, at that time. Uh, on the way to Madrid, uh, the Camino de Piedrola starts in yellow. This ropes uh, from the backbone uh, of the site and runs uh, north to south, crossing the, the quarries. Other secondary roads start from it uh, in white, which put the quarries in contact with Piedrola Road, this one with Madrid Road, and finally the place with the Cañada Real, in addition to living uh, in all directions. This uh, network of roads will uh, date from the time of the stone masons and will be the natural exit of uh, millstones of, to their destinations. Uh, well, uh, now we are going to see the pieces that uh, were produced here. The main tape are millstones, both for water mills, windmills, and oil mills. 144 examples of these grinding wheels have been documented at the site. And they are these uh, shape, uh, pieces with a central hole called I through which the wet was introduced. And these large stones of more than a meter in diameter and more than a ton in weight were moved at high speed by the force of wind or water in mills that were leading works of mechanical engineering in their, in their time. In the example, we see the basic diagram of a water mill. And here we see another example of a millstone, in this case for oil mills, or almazara, a, a word of clear Arabic origin, they are also big shape, uh, but instead of rendering horizontally, uh, they do it vertically, crushing the olives uh, to get an olive pass that will then be squeezed. They are called rulos in, Sp in Spanish. Uh, the next type of pieces are the stone piers for making wine. They are sinks uh, with a pouring gather uh, that were placed at the base of wine presses like this one. Uh, they are wooden structures with a press in which the grape uh, were deposited. Uh, the screw that was squeezing the fruit was activated to give rise the world, to the world. Uh, that was uh, that was collected in uh, in the stone pier and through the gather it was collected in in pottery containers. Six pieces of this type has been documented in, in Piedrola. The next type uh, is stone piers for olive oil productions. They are very similar to the previous, uh, except uh, that they are not complete stack. Uh, but only have one perimetral channel. This is due to the fact that the liquid obtained uh, from pressing the olive pass is much less than obtained from pressing the grape. Five pieces of this type have been uh, located. 
Finally, the 50 of uh, this uh, manufacturing the quarry are skew weights. In Spanish, they are called quintales. They are a counterweight for this type of type of presses. It's a large wooden beam. Uh, at one of its ends, the material to be pressed was placed. Uh, at the other end, it was screwed to a weight by means of a screw. Uh, Charlie screw, the counterweight rose, and due to its weight, the beam that was pressing the desired material was lower. Uh, it was a very ingenious way of transmitting the weight of several tons of this stone to the material to be pressed. Only three examples of these pieces have been documented in the quarry. Uh, as a part of the comprehensive study of the quarry, uh, petrographic and geochemical analysis were carried out to obtain a specific characterization of the Piedra de uh, The procedure follow to carry out this analysis was as follows. Starting from the geological map of Spain, uh, we identified the rock as uh, sandstone. Uh, afterwards, samples were taken from all the quarries that were analyzed by X-ray fluorescence. And here we see the procedure in situ in the quarry using portable equipment, uh, but samples were also sent to laboratory. The results of this analysis is as follows. The geochemical composition of the Piedra rock. This is what we have called the chemical signature of the rock that will, uh, that will allow us to be able to take samples of any millstone that we find and determine with precision if they come from Piedrola or not. And regarding the purely archaeological research of the site, the main methods were used were the following, intensive survey of the site to obtain a complete catalog of pieces, uh, drone flight to perform high precision photogrammetry of all quarries, and GPS to re georeference all the data obtained. All this data has been put together in a geographic information system from which to generate a complete and interactive uh, catalog of files. Well, see, here we see the film, the film notebook in which the survey was carried out and the final inventory with the photograph include. And here we can see the drone used for the drawing photogrammetry on the rock of the quarry. It is a Phantom 4 model and an aerial image of the quarry. And this is one of the general files in this catalog, we got, where we can see the high resolution ortho image with the dispersion of materials. The grinding wheels are in red. The stone pillars for wine in green. The screw weights in white. The stone pillars for olive oil in blue. And the cutting marks uh, and extraction fronts in green uh, and orange. On the right, we can see uh, the location of this specific quarry within the archeological site. In addition, individual files have been generated for each uh, of each piece uh, with their location in the query, uh, the aerial image from photogrammetry, uh, and a terrestrial photograph. And the problem with millstone quarries in Spain uh, is that they were a very little study. Uh, only one modern quarry had been excavated in the country, in the province of Soria, and there were many questions to answer uh, regarding the operation of carbon methods, the fuel use, or the specific dating of the exploitation. Uh, therefore, in 2017, we began the excavation of one of the quarries, the quarry number five, and this is the results after the first intervention, which only lasts a couple of weeks. Uh, some areas were excavated, uh, like this one or this one, uh, and those that look in a little more orange uh, color. In 2018, uh, we continued with another short two-week uh, field campaign uh, in which we were able to excavate, excavate more. Look at this entire area to the south where we removed all the sediment to the bedrock, revealing a multitude of extraction points and also enable a, a parking area at the entrance to the quarry. And finally, from the June to December of 2020, we were able to carry out a five-month campaign to fully excavate the entire quarry uh, several extraction points that had been used as a rubble dumps have been emptied, like this, and this, and like this. Uh, revealing with total clarity the myth of extraction by blocks and recovering some tools uh, from the work of the stonemasons. A complete adaptation of the site wa was also carried out, uh, uh, rectifying the boundaries, marking paths for visitors, uh, better adapting the parking area, and installing a specific uh, parking for bicycles, which you can see here, and the installation of interpretive panels in all the places. Now I would like you to show uh, you uh, some, bef uh, uh, some before and after images of the excavation. This is before and after. 
before, after, before, after, before, after, before, and after. And at some point, okay, iron wets and plates have been documented driven into the rock, just as the stone basin used from their work. Uh, in the last campaign in 2020, we were able to recover a set of a dozen wets in excellent conditions and wets and a half a hammer. Um, we were also able to locate wets in situ, still in the rock, as you can see. And finally, after this study, we can conclude uh, that uh, the quarries are only one part of an archaeological site larger in extension and chronological range. The quarry had an enormous productive potential with more than 15 hectares of surface in operation and more than 160 pieces documented in situ. Uh, the main extraction method is indirect by means of the extraction of quadrangular blocks that are cap one extract. And the direct extraction method has also been documented, although in a minority way. The production of this quarry uh, provides the necessary materials to make the main products of this region, flour, uh, wine, and olive oil. Uh, the quarry has been dated uh, using a typological criterion and documentary sources between the end of the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And the chemical signature of Piedra Rock has been obtained. Uh, this could make possible to identify millstone extract from this quarry at any point in the region. And Piedra Quarry is one of the best study millstone quarries in Spain, uh, thanks to use of high precision aerial photogrammetry as a documentation method, systematic excavation, and use of geographic information system. And to conclude, I would like to add that after these years of work, uh, Piedrola has become a leading site in the mutualization of industrial heritage and the first uh, millstone quarry open to the public in the region and the second in Spain. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is perfect timing, um, Angel. Thank you. Great, great presentation. I love to see your, you. your photographs. I love to see the photogrammetry. Um, and I'm really interested in your use of excavation at a surface quarry like that. Um, those are the kinds of quarries that I work in. And it's quite difficult persuading people that they need to do excavation yes, yes. in a, an yes, yes, open yes. surface quarry sometimes. Yeah, we've, um, I'm, I'm just, I just want to ask you one question before we move on to, um, to our next presentation. Um, it looks like quite an agricultural area, a lot of open fields in your aerial photographs. Have the yes. quarry sites been affected by farming um, or have they been left alone? Yeah. Um, we only uh, have the, uh, one one quarry of the 15 in total. It's, it's a 15 hectares uh, uh, area site, only all the quarries, and only uh, was excavated one of them. Uh, we will, uh, in, uh, with the investigation of the of the site, and uh, we have a lot of work with the Roman period, with the medieval period, and the the quarries are only one part of the of the site, but is the the easiest uh, place to to begin in in the in the in the research of the of the place great thank you thank you um that's wonderful we're going to move on to our second paper of this afternoon uh, our second paper is given by katarina katarina schrem from the juraj Jobrila university of pula and her paper is titled what to expect when you are documenting and excavating a roman quarry uh, Monte del Vescovo Istria in Croatia. Katerina, it's lovely to see you. It's lovely to have you here. And you. Um, if you'd like to begin, please. Yes, thank you. Hello to everyone. So my name is Katerina. And firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for accepting my abstract. And now. I hope you can see my presentation. So today I would like to talk about the Monte del Vescovo Quarry in Istria, Croatia. First off, I would like to start with a, a geographical introduction. We will be talking about the Istrian Peninsula, which is the uh, westernmost region of the Republic of Croatia. 
the largest part of the peninsula uh, belongs to the uh, Republic of Croatia with some smaller parts north uh, that are divided between Italy and Slovenia. Uh, Katarina, also, sorry, could I, Katarina, yes. sorry, could I just interrupt? We can't, have you got your first slide? Sorry, we just need to go back to the sharing. Yes, mm -hmm. the problem in the sharing, um, is it, are you sharing your PowerPoint? Can you please check in the screen that you're sharing? Ah, here we go. Do you see it? Okay, great, thank you, yes. sorry. Thank you, that's perfect. So uh, to uh, repeat uh, real quickly, we are talking about the Eastern Peninsula you can see on the map on your right. Uh, chronological introduction is also needed. We will be talking about the period of antiquity, which starts in the creation part of Istria in the middle of the first century before common era with the establishment of two colonies, Pola and Parentium, also you can see them on the map on your right. The whole of antiquity in Istria produced, so to speak, more than 300 Roman sites, mostly of rural characteristics, so Villa Rustiche, and they were located in, uh, in three Roman agri. You can see on this map, uh, north of Mirna Valley, we have Trieste Agar, then uh, south and up to the Lim Channel, we have the Parentium Agar, and then the larger part of the peninsula south, we have the, we have the Pola Agar. The great need for stone as a building material during antiquity is attested by a large number of quarries, mostly located on, along the coast. Since sea transport was the cheapest mode of transport, you can see St. Damien Quarry on your lower left, which has been known since uh, several decades, deca decades before. And uh, on your upper left, you see Flangy Quarry, which was discovered only recently, but more on that later. During the Archaeoculture project, which is the archaeological landscape and a sustainable development of cultural tourism in the municipality of Versar, it's a mouthful, but we have uh, used ALS data and LIDAR visualizations of the municipality, which you can see on, on this map here. And the, these visualizations helped us to discover new queries which uh, have been overgrown with, with uh, vegetation. Uh, some of these queries you can see on, on the left. Uh, Flangi mentioned earlier on the lower left and uh, one, of, uh, one of the other queries here on the upper left. And of course, today we will be talking about the Biskupovi Vrhi in Croatian or Monte del Vescovo query, which is actually a hill uh, that has several locations with traces of exploitation um, and uh, traces and marks of exploitation. We will be talking about the, the middle query, uh, one of the features you can see also in this photograph on your left. During field surveying January of last year, we documented several traces of exploitation in uh, this, uh, which is the biggest quarry on this hill. We saw channels uh, chiseled in order to extract a stone block that have a width of 20 centimeters. This is typical for a Roman quarry. Also, we, locate, uh, we uh, documented the, these traces on the query faces you see in the middle photograph and you see on the right, which have been uh, left by a, a tool we call a two-spiked hammer or, uh, or a pick. Also, they were made in order uh, during work in order to isolate a stone block and extract it. Uh, one of these tools was found uh, in, a, in a Roman site um, north of Parentium, this is what, what it looked like. Also, several months later, we proceeded to excavate the quarry. We found the quarry bottom here uh, in the form of stone blocks, as well as several mostly amorphous uh, stone, uh, stone, smaller stone blocks. Uh, the, this block, which we discovered at the bottom, had uh, uh, gave us one of the dimensions of the stone blocks, that's the width of one meter. But uh, from this block, we couldn't determine the length of the, of the extracted stone blocks. 
But this crude layout of the western part of this quarry, you see our trench here in red. Uh, and one of the uh, western uh, faces also gave us those channels you saw in one of the pro photographs with a distance of two meters. So uh, stone blocks extracted from here had a length of two meters. This is our second dimension. One of the other uh, query faces, this is the southern one, also gave us a height of extracted stone blocks, which is 80 centimeters. You see the, the bottom of the channels chiseled for extraction here, also here, and this is the bottom. Also, you can see the original uh, height of the sediment here in this our trench. So talking about the stone block dimensions uh, extracted uh, from this quarry, we have a length of two meters. We also uh, saw that we have a, a one meter width and 80 centimeters height. So we determined it was uh, probably for making sarcophagi uh, in, this, in this time. However, there were some channels of, on the, this is the northern face that gave us other smaller dimensions of extracted blocks around 70 centimeters in length, uh, uh, one meter in height. And you can see this is the same face, 60 centimeters, so let's say width which may be for uh, some other votive funerary, other objects, monuments. Maybe like these ones we found also during the excavation, you see on, on the left, uh, uh, unclear what this object was meant for. And the middle picture is probably a rim of a, a stone vessel. Also during excavation, we found lime throughout, the, throughout our trench, but no traces of lime production yet. For some further documentation, we used laser scanning to so we can get a clearer layout than uh, one of the crude ones you saw before. This was uh, this is a picture I wanted to show you in grayscale. Also, we see uh, a clear western and southwestern face of the quarry. Our trench is located here, stone blocks at the bottom, and so on. Also, we took a petrographic sample of the, of the stone uh, from this quarry for future reference base. This, this quarry is uh, situated on Jurassic Age deposits. And we, this particular sample was uh, defined as a recrystallized bioclastic rainstone according to Dunham, Dunham's classification. For a short conclusion, we wanted to uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to say that we determined this as a Roman query of, uh, because of some characteristics I showed you just now. Stone blocks that were extracted from this query were largely meant for making uh, sarcophagi and probably other funerary votive profane stone monuments or objects we saw, we also found during excavation. The traces we saw on the query faces were made by a pick or a two-spiked uh, two hammer and using the technique of chiseling channels in order to isolate a stone block and take it out from the, from the bedrock. This limestone, as I said, is a recrystallized bioclastic uh, grainstone, is very porous and that makes it easy to work on, which is also uh, an information that is, uh, that is important, important to have for the future, for future research of this query and other queries uh, in this municipality. Again, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and thank everyone for your attention. I'm open for comments and questions. Thank you so much, Katerina. It's so interesting. Um, what what a great site. I'm also really pleased to see that um, this is somewhere where you've been using LIDAR visualizations um, from the from the start to cope with that, that problem at, at our quarry sites. They are so often overgrown, aren't they? And they become difficult to study because of the vegetation. So that's a really interesting approach to, to try to 
um, to try to get the vegetation away without actually uh, cutting it all down <laughs> and ruining the environment. Um, I, I wanted to ask I wanted to ask a question um, before we move on to our next speaker, and then obviously we'll have more questions later on. But um, when you uh, have the evidence for the channels cut into the rock to remove blocks, is that on all of the sides of the stone? So, so, so the, the facing sides, but also the, the underneath, what is, how is the base uh, of a block? Is that also channeled away or is it levered out uh, I guess, on, a, on a natural? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess they used the wedges to, uh, to isolate it from, the, from beneath. Mm -hmm. So channels from the three sides and then from to isolate it from the bedrock, uh, they probably used wedges. Mm -hmm. Wooden okay. wedges, maybe even some metal wedges. That's my presumption. Yeah, yeah. It it it. Rem your your photographs reminded me of some of the soapstone quarries in the Scandinavian countries, in Norway and and Sweden, which were active in the Iron Age, uh, in particular. Um, and also later on in the Middle Ages, where there are large channels cut around the sides, but then they're, they're leave, the blocks are levered up off, off the bedrock. But of course, that's soapstone, which is much softer. And also the blocks are much smaller because they're usually for making vessels. So, um, yeah, that, was, uh, that, that struck me seeing your photographs. Thank you for your great illustrations. That's great. Um, so we will take we have got more questions, but we'll take them as part of the discussion after we've heard our third paper. So again, thank you, Katerina. And we're going to move on to our third and final paper of this session. It's going to be delivered by uh, by Daniel, Daniel Molhem from UMR Cité, Territoire, Environnement et Société. My French is terrible. <laughs> I'm really sorry, everyone, but I try. Um, uh, it, I would find it easier if it was in German. Never mind. Um, anyway, Daniel, we're really pleased to have you with us today. He's going to present his paper. It's called When Quarry Waste Explains Tool Marks. So this is really curious. I'm very much looking forward to this because I have a lot of quarry waste and some tool marks. I would like to be able to join them together. That would be good. So Daniel, uh, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Um... I hope you can see now my PowerPoint. Not quite yet. Let's see. Here we go. OK, so if you can play your PowerPoint, then we should. There we are. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so the sarcophagi production center of the Anglin and Garten Valleys was discovered at the end of the 1950s by Claude Lorenz, located at the frontier of Poitou and Berry, it's one of the very few sites of this kind currently known. The quarries are open in the limestone formation of the upper and middle Oxfordian, and approximately 1,250 sarcophagi were produced between the end of the 5th and the 8th century. Pierre Quarry is the largest and best preserved quarry of the site. It is also the only one that have been thoroughly researched, first by Claude Lorenz and since 2011 by me. It was fully excavated exclusively by hand between 2016 and 2020. The research carried out between 2011 and 2015 on the accessible parts of the quarry has enabled us to understand the overall extractive practices, tools, techniques, and strategies, but many questions remain unanswered. The total volume of the quarry and therefore the number of sarcophagi produced, the precise nature and reasons of the quarry development, the special organization of the worksite, the flow of the craftsmen and the transportation of the blocks and also the management of the walls, of the west, sorry. Pigrife Quarry is about 15 meter long, 10 meter wide and 10 meter high. It's, it is a quarry of a mixed type. It functions like an open air quarry while, while gradually sinking into the hillside. The production of the quarry is currently estimated at uh, 200 blocks, corresponding to around 80 entire uh, complete sarcophagi, plus about 40 blocks broken during extraction, cutting, or transport. Its exploitation is dated between the middle of the 6th and, and the end of the 7th century. During the extraction, the blocks are delimited by trenches and the detachment is made by 
striking metal wedges insert in long quarry holes called encoignures. They are normally laid out horizontally, flat or on edge, but sometimes also vertically. The exploitation is organized in extraction units of about uh, 4 to 20 blocks following a strict orthogonal uh, pattern. It is known that the waste of the upper part of the quarry was dumped directly at the foot of the hillside to create a working space between the hillside and the Anglin River. In the lower part of the quarry, that is in pit, quarrymen couldn't take away easily the waste. It, uh, it would have been too much work, but also and above all counterproductive, as the waste has an important role in the spatial management, management of the site. Cutting and extraction waste associated with the pit exploitation below the outside circulation level, therefore, represented at least 60% of the volume export. The base of the faces and floors of the quarry are now revealed, leaving the quarry as a vast empty shell whose relief and block scares provide a lot of information on the extraction techniques and the chronology of the exploitation. Query waste is characterized by its color, grain size, and slope, which depend on the area exploit and therefore on the variation in petro petrographic facies. It depends also on the action carried out, the topography of the quarry at a given moment, and the methods of dumping. Each type of layer is associated with a particular action, which can be car characterized in itself and linked in many cases, but not always, with a particular face. In this example, a succession of sloping layers can be seen at the ground level, corresponding to a direct discharge at the foot of the face. The overlying stratigraphy corresponds to a lateral dumping during the exploitation of the quarry faces located at the photographer's place. The large blocks testify to a cleaning of a sector of the quarry, while the thinner layers above correspond to the dumping as the extraction progresses. Other dumping methods exist linked to structures facilitating the management of material, like retaining walls, and for circulation and transport in the case of runs. Quarry waste is sorted by gravity, uh, which leads to alteration of the lower layers and mixing of the material. Other alteration phenomena have been highlighted, such as um, settling, landslides, or infiltration. In infiltration due to when. This makes it difficult to read the waste, which is almost impossible to excavate properly in plan, but is generally better seen and understood in section. So, a grid of one meter side orient, orient along the supposed extraction pattern was therefore set up at the beginning of the excavation in order to have the most accurate reading of this waste. Uh, during the archaeological dig, the frontal pro progression in two directions led to the simultaneous excavation of very different faces of the exploitation, for which the quarry faces and floors were not always known or even considered. This became more pronounced as the, ex as the excavation progressed, and, for example, in these two working photographs, six, six different faces are being cleared. For example, on the left, the wall F23, just here, corresponds to the opening of the lower quarry level, and on the right, the cone of Earth corresponds to the beginning of the last phases of exploitation. As we already said, today the quarry is an empty shell with uh, all the faces and floors visible, giving us a lot of technical information. Based on the block scares visible on the floor, but also taking into account the faces, it's possible to reconstruct uh, the various extraction units and the relative chronology of the lower level. However, uh, several anomalies and particularities of the exploitation can be observed, such as irregular detachment surfaces, differences in, differences in levels, an unexploited area, blocks extract uh, outside the exploitation pattern, or also rock strips, um, kind of small less de carrière in French. And all these features cannot be understood if only the faces and floor are considered, but they are, uh, 
but they can be explained when the West is. We know that the exploitation at the second level began in the southwest corner of the quarry. After a stepped development, an extraction, an extraction pit was dug to reach the maximum depth of the quarry. This pit is close to the south, west, and north, but partially open to the east due to the earlier and later extraction. As the quarry continued to the northeast, the quarrymen built a dry stone wall to store the waste in a reason way over a long period. This enabled them to keep a successive working unit accessible, to keep a clear working area at the foot of the face to move and cut the blocks, and also to reserve a space for their evacuation, perhaps by vertical lifting. The wall was carefully constructed with pieces of leads and chests cut out and set aside just in front of it to, um, in order to be easily worked. You, you have here the, these pieces. And uh, the, the use of the wall was abandoned when it became too high and the new extraction area was large enough. Quarrymen then began to cover it and to close off the southwestern pit. Uh, another wall is then built to accommodate the progress of the exploitation. Again, a working space is reserved between the quarry faces and the wall. And here, in the absence of spatial constraints, the quarrymen did not need to sort the blocks to be used, and the wall therefore has a less regular appearance. The position and orientation of the wall also suggests several phases of extraction of the horizontally arranged blocks on the northern face, northern face of the quarry. Concerning the chest extracted um, just on the right, perhaps associated with this face, its location is not random. Indeed, it has been observed that ver vertical blocks are always extracted in corners between two extraction units, but at this point of the exploitation, the only two existing corners, the red stars in the plan, were covered with west and therefore inaccessible. So the quarrymen choose to ex extract the needed, the need chest outside the quarrying framework in a sector destined to be quickly filled. <clears throat> At the end of the excavation in November 2020, we discovered two small block scares in the northeast corner of the quarry, corresponding to a chest and a lid of a child sarcophagus of one meter forty centimeter long. This is the only example of this kind currently identified in a Merovingian uh, sarcophagi quarry, which is rather surprising insofar as the lids and chest in town for children are generally cut on quarries uh, from large blocks broken during extraction and, and uh, cutting, and on funerary sites from reused ancient architectural blocks. And while the reasons of this extraction and its, its place on the, in the quarry production are difficult to understand, its location on the edge of the hillside can be explained. Like the vertical chest present earlier, this sarcophagus is, is placed outside the quarry framework. Again, this was not a problem as the exploitation was not intended to develop in this direction. On the contrary, this is exactly where the access pass and ramps associate um, with the last phases of exploitation were laid out. This location was therefore covered very quickly with earth and quarry west. The next wall, built uh, in, in at least two stages, tells a more complex story linked to several sectors of the quarry. I will mention, mention here only a few elements. Um, we can see in the plan that the second section in red is uh, linked to a southern extraction unit and destroy part of the wall F29. You, you have the photograph here. And this, this, uh, this proves that this unit is posterior to those located to the east, just here. What the study of the block scares alone did not allow us to confirm due to the lack of, con of contact between these different extraction units. This chronology 
also explain the level difference with the center of the query, uh, which was filled during the previous phases of exploitation. And it explained also the query strip marking the eastern limit of all F23, the, the, the destruction of which would have caused a major collapse of the West rest, um, written behind. <coughs> The meticulous excavation of the West also allowed us uh, to identify a reworking in the northeast corner of the quarry. As we can see on, in the section, the digging of the West is, clear, is clearly visible. But without any reference faces, the quarrymen had slightly shifted the unit from the general layout, what, um, what is also shown by a tiny quarry strip you have here. West also has in, an influence on the extraction techniques. And for example, in the southern unit mentioned before, detachment surfaces of the blocks are strongly convex and the long quarry holes are tilt more than necessary. The re regular quarry holes like, are like this. And in the example, it's uh, sloppy like this. And this, um, This particular form can be explained by the presence of sloppy waste at the foot of each new face. And here, quarrymen did not take the effort to clean the base of each face to dig a horizontal quarry hole in order to have a regular and horizontal detachment surface, but instead choose to make it along the slope of the waste. The bulge resulting from the splitting was not a problem as the exploitation was not intended to go any deeper here and the bulges were directly were directly covered by New West, as you can see here on this photograph. And to conclude, excavation of Quarry West is certainly a lengthy and thankless task in view of the volume and weight of material to be removed, but the few examples present here demonstrate it is worth it if we, if we want to fully understand the quarry. The analysis of the data acquired Um, uh, obtained over the last five years will take a long time, and some questions are still unanswered, particularly concerning blocks transportation before the construction of turbines. Also, a 4D modeling of the quarries plan to test the current, the current assumptions and to better understand and illustrate the special complexity of Pierre-Griffé pie quarry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was fascinating. I'm just amazed at that site in, in particular. My my first question, actually, although you you explained it um, uh, in your in your presentation, was whether it is possible to see the exact order in which blocks were taken up. But obviously, that that is possible to record that sequence. That's that's great. And And again, really pleased to see excavation going on at sites like this, because yes, it is difficult sometimes persuading people that this is what we should do. But look at the beautiful stratigraphy and how wonderfully recorded that is. That's that's marvelous. Um, so uh, I, I've, I'm just going I'm just going to ask you one question myself, Daniel, before we bring everybody back and move on to questions from from everybody. I just wondered, are you able to tell us anything about the tools that were being used uh, in the quarry? Yes, of course. Um, we we have many tools used. Um, the same we have seen in the previous presentation. And for example, for the the digging of the trenches, you you have the use of a, a pick. Uh, a classic pick, and also have a escud, a, a Roman uh, Roman type pick with a um, uh, without, enfin, not the kind with a two tooth, two teeth, mm -hmm. but with a flat uh, extremity. Uh, you you have also uh, for the cutting the use of a, a cutting hammer to to make. Uh, uh, To make straight uh, part of um, uh, side of each block, and also the use of the polka mm -hmm. uh, and to uh, to to allow the the chest. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And also wedges for the, the splitting of, uh, of blocks. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's great. So um, we're hopefully going to be able to bring everybody back in. And uh, Claudia is going to help organize doing uh, the questions that we have. Um, to allow Claudia to do that, I have a question for all three of our speakers. Um, so I'll ask it and then ask each of you to, to respond. Um, I'm really interested to know if um, if you have evidence for the paths, the roads and the routes out of the quarries, um, uh, out of the quarries uh, to the places where, where the, the products were being used, is that something you've looked at? Is that something you have yet to do or is it at all obvious or not? So I'll start with Katerina. Katerina, what, what information do you have about the routes out of the quarries? Yes, uh, thanks to the LiDAR visualizations, we we can see some of the, let's say, ramps that ran from the top of the hill to the, to the, to the lower parts from the, you know, through the slopes. And this query is actually very close to the supposed stretch of the Roman road that went yeah. through Parentium, which is up north, northwest, mm -hmm. and uh, down to down to Pola, so it's very close to a, a main road system, suppose it. And uh, the 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 coast is actually, I think, somewhere between two or three kilometers uh, as the crows fly. They would say from the from the coast, which is uh, perfect actually for transport. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and Angel, how about the millstone sites? You mentioned some of the main roads in the region, but what other uh, what other um, routes, if any, have you been able to record out of the quarries? Yes, uh, we think uh, that the quarries uh, is uh, go through the mill uh, through the Royal the Cañada Real that sits uh, away from the um, uh, from the um, the animals. It's a, 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 a big uh, roads in the in the field that is the principal roads in in the in the in that in that uh, time and uh we think that the the the, the millstone uh, go uh, get out uh, from the quarry through the this uh, this great road uh, and in this great road uh, crossing the all the region through through the mills thank you um and daniel to take the sarcophagi from the quarry to to where they were needed what what evidence have you gotten from that site about the the <laughs> transport network um, we, we know that the sarcophagi were transported by um, by boat. Uh, at Pigrife, we have the, uh, the the river only 20 meters from the hillside, and many many sarcophagi quarries in France are um, are located just a few few meters from uh, from from a river. There are exceptions, of course, but. Uh, all the sites I know in uh, in Berry, in Touraine, in, in central France, are in this uh, uh, kind. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so I know we've got some specific questions for our presenters. So, Claudia, I'll I'll, yes, I'll please, stop please, please. I'll stop asking the things I'm interested in. And allow the I know, I know, it's irresistible, right? Um, <laughs> uh, we do have some questions from the YouTube channel and. Uh, there was one that was appearing and is appearing, yes, from Anaïs <laughs> Johangel. And she was asking if you know uh, when the millstone eyes, I guess, like the holes are made, if that is at the quarries or at the mill side. Yes, uh, we have uh, evidence that the, the holes are carved in the, in the, in the quarry. Uh, uh, for us, uh, simple que uh, question, uh, the, uh, the, pay, the payment for the, for the millstone is uh, once uh, the, the the millstone is installed in in, in the mill, uh, and the the carving of the of the eye of the hole in the millstone is the very is a very critical moment in the in the production of a of a millstone. Uh, we have a lot of examples of millstones uh, cracking in in this moment of the of the of the carve the the hole, and then if you carve the hole at the mill you need to get to the to the quarry for another meal and go to them and, that. 
and in the in the in the in the, in the quarry itself, we have a lot of of millstones with the with the whole scarves cracking and without the quarry. Of course, thank you. Um, and there is another uh, question that came uh, still through the, uh, the streaming channel. Um, it's from Thierry Gregor and it's for Katerina and Daniel. Um, and here it is. If, are the volumes of the blocks extracted for the sarcophagi the same? Do you feel that there is a modular uh, shape? Yes. Um, Merovingian sarcophagi are smaller and uh, above all trapezoidal but the length is about uh, two meters and uh, the head um, headland uh, larger uh, wide sorry is uh, 60 70 centimeter and the eye between between 40 and uh, and 60 maximum for the the chest and evidently the the lid is uh, smaller Mm -hmm. Katerina, at the quarry site you're excavating, then do you see the? You mentioned some of the dimensions. Are they are they uh, commonly regular like that, or have you seen any variation? Uh, I guess there are variations. Of course, uh, it uh, all all depends on how they wanted to, the sarcophagus to look like. Uh, if they wanted to decorate it in relief, uh, they probably then needed a, a bigger bigger sarcophagus. So I would say. It, varies of course but mostly from the dimensions we saw on the query faces they were mostly the same of course we had the luck of finding that stone block isolated on the bottom of the query we hope we'll find other ones so we can see maybe this variation you are talking about we'll see we'll see of course thank and you it's amazing like a lot of questions are coming um and here there is another one uh, and it's still for Daniel. Um, so Ben Russell is asking if you get a sense of whether any detailed decorative carving was done in the quarry, or uh, was this all elsewhere, or were these sarcophagi not often decorated? What's your well, idea? Uh, if I may uh, continue, uh, we oh, found yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of waste uh, during excavations. And uh, some of these amorphous, I call them amorphous blocks, have tool marks. And I presume maybe it's uh, they hollowed out this stone blocks so they can make them easier for transport. So some of the blocks we found were like uh, angled at an angle, maybe just for hollowing out the sarcophagus. I'm not sure about the whole process of decoration. They probably did that at a workshop somewhere, not at the, at the quarry site. But I think their main job was to make them their job easier. So they hollowed out the blocks at the site according to the, the, the blocks we found during excavation, the, according to the debris. Mm -hmm. Of course. And what about your sarcophagi, Daniel? Did yes. you notice any uh, decoration? Uh, only a part of the, the production is, um, is carved, sculpted, they decorated. Um, but in the quarry, so the blocks are extract, cut. Uh, the idea is to to to, to make a, a usable sarcophagi, but we don't have evidence of the the sculpture inside the quarry. And maybe it's not inside really the quarry. It's uh, it's done. Two hypotheses are, are possible outside the quarry before the the boat uh, transportation. But the question is why put uh, put here a sculpture, and for who is uh, each sarcophagi? And I guess the quarrymen don't know when they they produce which. Uh, who is uh, the guy who will be buried uh, in the in the pieces? And we have uh, another hypothesis that is that the decoration is made on the funerary site, or at least on a workshop elsewhere of the quarry. Sorry if I'm my terrible English. <laughs> no, 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 it was absolutely clear, fantastic. And if I may, uh, before we take out other questions or while some, somebody types in, in, in YouTube, I have a, a question for Angel um, about your uh, 
the geological side. I'm a bit of an archaeometry nerd, but um, I, I, I noticed that you guys used some analytical methods as well, and uh, especially like handheld XRF. And uh, I was I was curious to know how did you deal with the fact that uh, you were working with you are working with sandstone, which is tricky when it comes to geochemical signatures. Um, and since you probably have these layers and the sequence is discontinuous, I assume, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was wondering if you could see that some layers were had like, were used for some types of mills, if there was some kind of difference or was it all the same? We have a uh, recognized uh, almost uh, three three levels of, of, of sandstone in the, in the quarry, and the the millstone are uh, made, uh, but only one the the, mid, the middle level of, of this of this stratigraphy. The the upper level is discarded uh, totally because it's a very it's not hard. It's a it's a, a rock that, uh, that is uh, it's no it's no valid for the for the for the millstone. Yes. And the uh, uh, lower level is uh, very hard to, to work and is very compact and is not in, not the characteristic uh, correct for the fabrication of a of a milson. Uh, then uh, we have the XRF uh, in the in this uh, in these uh, pieces in the millstones, uh, and we need to pr pr prove uh, if taking a, a sample of a millstone in the in the in the mills and compare, comparing the results with uh, our chemical signatures, it works. Uh, we don't know now uh, yet if, if it will work, but uh, we, we hope so. Thank you. Um, and well, while we are uh, speaking now, I'm just going to transmit a question. I'm not going to project it, but uh, just ask to Hangel something that uh, remind to Daniel something he was asking before to Hangel in the chat. I don't know if you, Daniel, want to ask the question yourself. Uh, you were asking about uh, waste. In yes, and, and also for Katarina, because I don't saw on your presentation waste, like uh, I present myself. Uh, in Katarina uh, quarries, there is a lot of earth, but no, not a huge layer of, uh, of waste. I don't saw... Uh, so you, you don't have the clean uh, the, the quarry? Uh, we did have waste. Uh, there was a thin layer of uh, humus. Uh, and then maybe around 30 centimeters uh, layer of debris, a lot of debris. Uh, of course, this uh, trench was seven meters long by and uh, wide, one meter wide. So it wasn't the same everywhere. But on the northern part of the of the quarry, there was a lot of a lot of debris. Uh, some of which you saw on the on these photographs, uh, more or less uh, around uh, maybe half a meter uh, was the biggest was the biggest uh, amorphous block we found. Can you uh, maybe it's too too early, but uh, have you an idea of the the volume that represents the waste or, or can represent the West um, uh, par rapport en, en anglais. Compared uh, to, <laughs> compared to, <laughs> yeah. compared to the, the whole volume of the quarry. We still haven't haven't done that. It's uh, yeah. too early for now to say. We we plan to excavate it further, and uh, this excavation was uh, in tenth uh, uh, month of the October in October. <laughs> So uh, it's uh, I haven't done this this analysis yet, but I'm I'm certainly planning to. Right. Um, there is another question uh, from the outside world, um, and it's here. Maybe Antonella, yes, can help us with that. It's for Javier again. Um, if where all this core is exploited only for millstone extraction or if the quadrangular blocks were shaped later so that you can be sure that there were no other uses? Yes, uh, the principal use of this quarry is the, uh, the production of, of millstones. It's, uh, it's true that it's a residual uh, use for making uh, other pieces like uh, the stone piers or the, or the skew weight, 
but if you was uh, asking to me if uh, in this query is uh, producing producing a, a quadrangular blocks for construction for example we know no have uh, evidence of this for the uh, in the in the region uh, Alcázar San Juan in the town that is the the place the the archaeological site, the ancient buildings are uh, made with uh, sandstone, but it's a red sandstone, uh, very concrete, uh, a red sandstone. Uh, the sandstone of Piedra is a white sandstone that we uh, not found in another place that in the only in the millstones. Uh, we think that it's um, very and probably that. Uh, the use of, of construction uh, but in the roman villa in the at the same place we have found uh, some ciliars uh, that uh, made a uh, seams made with the rock of the of the of the site it's logical uh, you live in a, in a in a quarry you use the, the material of the quarry for construction your buildings but more uh, the principal use is, is the is the millstone okay. Um, I'm looking into other um, questions, but I don't know if you have other questions for each other until I look into them. <laughs> um, I found another one. Actually, Anais was um, asking two questions, one for Katerina and one for Daniel. The one for Daniel was if you found artifacts inside the waste um, and the one for Katarina, I'm just going to say both. Um, and the one for Katarina was if you um, saw the escud traces like tool marks as Daniel was mentioning this specific Roman tool like pick. Um, the toothed pick. Now that I read the question, um, <laughs> any to pick or was it just a normal, uh, a regular pick? <laughs> uh, if I can answer, uh, the the one tool uh, whose uh, marks we saw on the query face, I think it is the the pick for the the main part of querying, which is isolating stone blocks. I haven't yet uh, seen any marks uh, from uh, from other tools, maybe for f some finer finer work on the on the stone blocks. Okay. And in the in Pigrife we have uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a uh, uh, box like uh, this of ceramics, which is uh, <laughs> very uh, enormous. And also a lot of charcoal that um, that are from the, the outside of the quarry. Because of the pit exploitation, we know that the quarrymen uh, lived heat just outside in the in the base of the hillside and um, when they make a fire when they broke uh, a pot they push it uh, in the in the quarry in the pass in the ramps and so we we discover it um, mainly at the entrance uh, at this entrance of the quarry great and I think that what Daniel was saying is just uh, is uh, a perfect bridge for your question, Cathy. Yes. Uh, so I have a question for, for all three speakers, which Daniel has just answered. So how far away is the nearest uh, settlement site? Actually, where are the people working in the quarries living? Are they living nearby or, or further away? And, and what evidence, if any, is there? Um, so D Daniel just answered that. Katerina, how about the, the, your quarry site? Do you have that information? Uh, yes, the the closest one. Uh, if you remember that photograph with a uh, with a, it was a water and cistern. Uh, it's a site called Monterico, which was also a Villa Rustica. So it's around, mm, well, I'm not sure, maybe half a kilometer from from the, this site. But also, I saw a question about a necropolis around the hill, on this hill. Yeah. Uh, yes, we found actually on the western on the western side of the hill. Uh, our colleague from the project uh, did a field survey and found some uh, sarcophagi in the in, in the in bedrock. So it wasn't mm -hmm. an isolated block. Maybe some even isolated blocks. I'm not sure. It was a, a quick field survey, but they found actually uh, it's not a necropolis, but some sarcophagi on the western side of this hill, which is also very 
very interesting. Mm. Yes, and, and Angel, how about the millstone quarries? Where are the people um, living who are actually working the quarry? Yes, the nearest place is Alcázar de San Juan, is uh, six kilometers away. And the next uh, place uh, nearest is Quero in the north, uh, five kilometers away. But we think that the, the, the stonemasons uh, uh, live in the, in, the, in the quarry, in the, in, in the, in the, in the archaeological sites. I, there are some houses uh, from the modern age and before, from the Middle Ages and uh, the Roman period. And the, the name of the place, Piedrola, uh, can be a proceed of uh, Petra, in Latin, Petra, Petrula, little, little rock, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, probably that the quarry uh, is in use in, in, in Roman times, but we can prove this. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we think that the, the people live in the, the quarry. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I see. I see your what you wrote in the in the question, Cascati, and I was thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, should should we have a nice question? Yeah, perhaps. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Anais. Uh, Anais had another question related to the Milstone Eye, the the hole, like as as we were talking before, Angel, and she was asking if we can assume that the size of the Milstone Eye is always the same. Then it's not all, it's not always the same a, a very little difference but it's not always the same but we think that it, the 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 meal the, 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 the owner of the meal uh, itself uh, is uh, adapting the the millstone for his own uh, meal uh, the meal the, the the owners have a, a, a con, it, it's a it, it that that's what we think uh the in the in the quarry is uh, producing a, a a mill a millstone a millstone, and the millstone almost finished is, is to them to the mill, and in the mill, or the stone mason, or the or the owner of the mill adapt the the millstone for for, for the installation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay. Um, I don't know, Kathy. Do you want to? Ask? Well, perhaps, perhaps then, because we're very nearly at two o'clock. So, if we just have this one last question for all three presenters, and then after that, we'll have to to call it a day <laughs> and move on. So, the question is: Do you think the quarry sites were worked throughout the year, or were they worked seasonally only at certain times of the year? So, um, uh, Daniel, how about the sarcophagus quarries? Because, of course, sarcophagi are needed throughout the year, but do you think the quarries were worked all the year or just at certain times? Um, it's, uh, it's temporary because you don't need sarcophagi all the year. Sarcophagi are for uh, rich people. And if you consider the area of distribution of these products, uh, there are not a lot of people... Um, uh, richer to, to buy a sarcophagi that uh, will, will die uh, in the year of the, the five uh, next year. So I, um, I think the, the production is planned for the one, two, three, four, ten years maybe, and uh, the, the quarrymen come, extract um, uh, a defined number of sarcophagi for all the market uh, during the, the five or then uh, next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Katerina, how about the quarry you've been working at? Well, I wouldn't like to assume anything right now, but uh, uh, the winters here in, in Istria now, maybe it was uh, somewhat different 2000 years ago, but they're not very harsh. Of course, it always uh, uh, depends on who worked in these quarries, whether they were slaves or workers. If they are slaves, you know, it's it would probably be a different answer to your question than some professional workers but that's 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 everything i would like to say to that question no, of course of course that's fine thank you and and hell how about the millstone quarries sorry uh, can you repeat me the question please yes do you do you think the do you think the millstone quarries were in operation throughout the year oh, okay. or seasonally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, we think that operate almost all the all the year, but in summer uh, the region uh, reach uh, forty five or fifty degrees. Yeah, I, I need no no um, no trees and 
very little uh, water. The La Mancha in, in, in the center of Spain is a very dry region. We think the the, the main period for work is the, the winter, the, and the and the spring, and maybe the summer. But uh, we can we can. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a very hot <laughs> yes for, for work Th thank you very much um th thank you all for all three of your of your presentations they're really interesting um uh, we we don't really we don't quite have enough time left for some more questions but hopefully everybody is able to stay on for um for the next part of our day which um we're moving on to zoom and i think claudia is going to say something about that Yes, um, so probably also like Anais and um, Marie-Lise can join us on stage. Um, on stage, on <laughs> streaming, I don't know how to call it. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, so since we are ending quite early and that would uh, leave all of us time for, uh, you know, uh, do other things as well. But before we do that, um, we would also like to throw an idea uh, towards you all. I don't know how many people are following now the streaming, but uh, of course for the presenters and whoever wants to join us, we would like to um, uh, have a little moment to discuss what could be done with this after this conference and uh, since we gathered a bunch of people, like a lot of people actually, who are uh, as interested as we are about uh, stones and stones carving and all these uh, slightly nerdy things that we all like so much, uh, we would like to try to join forces and see um, if we can link our research to each other. Um, so I will just shut up and show you a little PowerPoint that we prepared for this. It should be there. Voila. Um, here it is, do you see it? Yes, thank you. Fine. So the idea that we had when we started organizing this conference it was that well we should try a way try to find a way to keep all these amazing people connected and linked to each other uh, because especially because of the fact that we can't see each other in person uh, during these days we thought that it would be good to have a little moment that is a bit less formal of course this platform has been absolutely fantastic for handling all the um presentations uh but uh, maybe we can move on a different media just for being able to speak uh, more than 10 people at the same time uh and uh, and share our our thoughts so the idea is that we would like to ask you if you are interested in the building of an international network of people who are working on carved sites, so rock cut sites and quarries, considering that the methodological and theoretical challenges that people encounter when doing this kind of research are often similar, we thought it could be uh, interesting to have a more long-term platform or some kind of organization to share our experience. Um, so why do we want to do that? Uh, as I was saying, because there are some uh, theoretical and methodological issues uh, or interesting points, let's put it that way, that it's probably better to face together or to discuss about um, since, like from in my direct experience, uh, sometimes working on this kind of card features uh, make people feeling a bit lonely <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, not really understood, so <laughs> let's help each other in that. No, I'm joking, but uh, <laughs> it is true that there are several different traditions of studies in different countries that are associated, for example, with specific vocabularies. In some countries, the study of quarries and rocket sites is more developed in some others, is, uh, let's say, developed in another way. So it would be interesting to cross this experiences and see 
um, what comes out of it. Um, and also try to promote uh, what we have done during this conference. So try to promote the idea that there is a sort of technical, technological lens that we can all use to study these sites in an absolutely di diachronic way. So it doesn't matter if we work on uh, um, prehistoric uh, underground sites or um, like contemporary uh, quarries. It's, it's, it's all like a very similar methodological uh, and theoretical problem that we are approaching. Uh, the other thing that we would like to chat with you about is uh, how we do that. If we want to do that, then how we do that? Um, this is not intended to replace any other existing network, uh, but uh, the more the merrier in the sense that um, it just wants to maybe try to merge different experiences and bring out um, in a way that we can exchange best practices and previous experience in the in the field. And also this would be useful uh, with the idea of maybe building projects together. We all know how research and academia works these days and having a strong international network of colleagues working on similar issues can be also very useful when it comes to uh, building bigger projects, building bigger networks. Um, so that's also uh, a possible goal. And uh, finally, promoting what we are doing in the sense that uh, doing some didactic experiences, involve other people in uh, this broader community could be uh, absolutely interesting. So what we see as forthcoming projects or things we can do now uh, standing on uh, the ground of this experience of today or tomorrow is that we could try to analyze uh, we could try sorry to organize a second conference in two years hopefully there won't be a pandemic anymore <laughs> and we will be able to sit around the table and shake each other's hands um, so this is the idea. Maybe try to uh, broader, uh, broaden a bit the, the scale of um, inquiry. So go from now we went to the uh, very detailed analysis of extraction procedures, and maybe we can think for the next step to open a bit our um, uh, research perspective to the landscape, for instance. But we are uh, open, of course, to any kind of ideas about that. And also another. Um, uh, idea we were thinking about is that we could organize thematic workshops amongst like people uh, within the network, but also open to uh, whoever is interested in um, these kind of themes. So this is what we thought about, and we would like to invite you to join us on Zoom to tell us what you think about this, if you're interested, and how you want to shape this possible network. So grab a coffee or a beer or a whiskey or whatever you feel more suitable for the time being. Uh, and you will find a Zoom link uh, on the uh, website. You have seen there is a conference website. We will share it uh, on Facebook but for a very short bit. Then we will take it away because it's not safe to have this kind of uh, links around. But uh, you will for sure find it on uh, on the um, on the conference website. Just log in. Uh, we just move there. And thanks again to Antonella and Francesca who have been like helping us with this platform. Uh, we see each other tomorrow. So yeah. That was it. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. Um, yeah, I want to say a very big thank you in especially to uh, Antonella for uh, running today really behind the scenes and for coping with us. <laughs> and thank you to all of our speakers from today. We look forward to our speakers for tomorrow. Uh, thank you again to the, the institutions that have supported with, with funding and with hosting. It's just wonderful that we can put this together 
and to the organisers for a great first day and I'm sure will be a great second day as well. So please do join us on Zoom. Um, hopefully you will find the link. Uh, I will make myself a cup of tea and I will see everybody there in about five minutes or so. So have a great rest of your day and see you soon. See you. Bye. Thank you. See you soon and see you tomorrow. Bye bye.